everyone. A very warm welcome. I'm glad to introduce myself. Uh, I am Mercy Rufina, a PhD student in Dr. Vinod Skaria's lab at uh, CSIR IGIB. This is yet another interesting session of Mendel's Bicentenary Celebrations. Today, we have with us here Dr. Shubhabrata Chakrabarti. Dr. Chakrabarti is the Associate Director of Research at LV Prasad I Institute. I must also mention that he's a genome biology specialist who has done a part of his training at the National Eye Institute at NIH in USA. And I must also mention that he has contributed to some pioneering works in the functional genomics of glaucoma and age-related macular degeneration. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to this platform, sir. And uh, like I've mentioned, so we have put together a few interesting questions about the Mendelian discoveries, human genetics, and how it is impacting modern science and research practices on a current scale. So we have seen your uh, research on common eye diseases and disorders. So it will be great if you could elaborate us on what is your exact uh, research interests or, or what is your lab currently focusing on nowadays? Oh, well, uh, thank you, Mercy, for that question. And thank I would also like to thank IGIB for this kind invitation and this program. I think this is a very relevant program where we are celebrating the bicentenary uh, anniversary of uh, Gregor Mendel, uh, most of which, most of us who have had our uh, formal education in genetics, we all began with Mendel. And so that is where the relevance of Mendel is, and it is even uh, relevant today in the context of not only human genetics, but even when human genetics has advanced to the field of genomics, that is very, very relevant. So coming back to your question, uh, uh, I am actually a human geneticist by training and profession. Uh, so I had my basic training in India where I was particularly interested in eye genetics because my PhD was on understanding the genetics of retinitis pigmentosa, that is one of the common blinding conditions. Right. And that kind of stirred me into taking up ocular genetics and later ocular genomics as a profession. Um, and as you mentioned, I also had some formal training at the NEI. Uh, so after my PhD, I joined the LB Prasad Eye Institute, which is one of the uh, primary or, or one of the tertiary referral eye care centers of the country and has been in the forefront of eye research per se. So we have a small group of uh, people in the area of genomics, but uh, the group has now expanded to include other areas as well. We have people from biochemistry, microbiology, stem cell biology, uh, and diagnostics, innovations, public health, low vision rehabilitation, and another interesting uh, group of optometry based research. Mm -hmm. So now it has expanded very widely compared to when we began our research at LV Prasad I Institute almost two decades back. So my lab particularly focuses, and it is also the priority of LV Prasad I Institute, that we always care for diseases which are common in the population. Yeah. And in that sense, uh, when we started doing our initial research on genetics of eye diseases, I chose uh, one of the common disease, uh, not common though, it's a common in this particular part of the country. I'll tell you the reasons in a minute. Um, it's actually a rare disease when seen in the global context. It is a glaucoma in children called primary congenital glaucoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason it is common here is because it has a very high prevalence. In the undivided state of Andhra Pradesh, when we did our first, uh, first epidemiological survey, we found that the prevalence of was of this disease was one in 3,300 live births. So that is the magnitude of the problem. And uh, if untreated, this is a congenital disease, and if untreated, it leads to permanent blindness. Uh, patients usually present almost from the first day of birth. It could be from anywhere between one to three years to early infancy. That's the onset of the disease. Uh, since it was a very common problem, and uh, it is not a major problem in other parts of the world. It's very common in southern India. It's also common in uh, Saudi Arabian populations. It is common among the gypsies. 
And again, if you see that uh, the prevalence rises in only in those populations which practices consanguinity and inbreeding. Uh, so in the Western populations, for instance, it is around one in uh, 20,000 to one in 30,000 live births. So it's not, a, not really a major problem for them. So we wanted to understand that this being an autosomal recessive disease. So what is the, what is the profile of this disease, both in terms of its clinical profile and its genetic profile? Uh, at that time, already the candidate gene, one of the candidate gene was mapped. Uh, that was a cytochrome P450 gene, which is otherwise known as CIPON-B1. And mutations in this gene was attributable to this disease. So when we started exploring this, we found that uh, those uh, homozygous mutations could address only to, let us say, about 20% of the entire population. So obviously, there were other candidates which were yet unexplored. And over a period of time, we have used different methods, particularly not only candidate gene screening, we have used runs of homozygosity, we have used GVAS, we have used uh, whole exome sequencing. And prior to that, we also use uh, some, uh, some form of targeted sequencing. So okay. with that, now we have some idea, though we do not have the complete genetic profile of PCG yet, but we still know that Candidate genes collectively account for 20 to 30 percent of the cases. Other genes, including um, the targets that have been obtained from whole exome sequencing, etc., uh, uh, would actually contribute to another uh, 30 percent or so. So, remaining 40 percent still is a mystery, and I would not say a mystery uh, because we haven't uh, kind. Of, I mean, that is a work in progress because these are not attributable to just uh, a single gene or mutations in a single gene. Mm -hmm. So in many of these cases, there are interactions across multiple genes. Mm -hmm. And that is where our work, as you mentioned in the initial statement, that our work on functional genomics mm -hmm. is trying to explore that given that there are genetic interactions across alleles mm -hmm. in different genes, are there corresponding physical interactions as well? And that is one of the primary focus of our lab currently. So we use a variety of multi-tier approach to delineate what are the genes, what are the variants, and how do they interact. And currently we are also exploring the mitochondria and trying to understand are there crosstalks between the nuclear and the mitochondrial variants that would also account for this uh, condition. So that is one of the primary focus of our lab. Um, and uh, many students have graduated uh, working on this area. Uh, and uh, we have generated a very large amount of data uh, right. just because we had a very high volume of cases. Mm -hmm. As I said, the disease was very prevalent and we have kind of genotyped almost all of these cases. Mm -hmm. uh, another area where we are working very deeply is in genetic epidemiology. Mm -hmm. And this is primarily, again, uh, I mean, the context of Mendel will come back and forth to us, is to identify that, okay, if you have a variant, how confident you are that this is likely to be pathogenic. Right. And since in the Indian scenario, we did not have deeply phenotyped controls. Mm -hmm. So we, our uh, genetic epidemiology study, which actually initially gave us the prevalence of multiple eye diseases in the southern Indian context, we are now trying to explore um, the biological context of these conditions. So we have a large cohort, which was uh, sampled way back in 1996. And this is a longitudinal cohort. We followed them up 10 years down the line and again for the 10 years down the line. So there has been 15 to 20 years of follow-up. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we are trying to understand are uh, the markers for disease progression. So given that uh, at that um, age of entry, as you would say, uh, when they were in their 40s, so now they would be definitely in their 60s or 70s or 80s, depending mm -hmm. on what age they were. So if they did not develop any ocular condition compared to those who developed an ocular condition, are there differences in their genomic profile, both in terms of the genes, the variants, and 
coupled with other parameters like the clinical parameters, the imaging data, the, and other risk factors. So we are trying to kind of provide something like uh, similar to the UK Biobank, where we are kind of generating this uh, controls, uh, the database of controls uh, for ocular phenotypes. So that is another area that we are going to do. Right. That was uh, indeed very interesting, sir. So eye disorders, like as you mentioned, is seem very common, and uh, you have brought some uh, brought some uh, important point also, especially in communities where endogamy is practiced. So uh, in India, this context is really really relevant. So uh, with the same context, I would like to ask you. So uh, how do you think is the awareness? about this Mendelian genetics, the concept of diseases running through families, how do you think it's the awareness is right now? Or uh, what would you say, why is it important to know genetics as a student or as a common man? What's the importance to know that? Yeah, now that because genetics and genomics are in the forefront of biomedical research, mm -hmm. so the common thread that binds all of this is the fundamental knowledge of inheritance. Right. And that is why it is very important to know, uh, know about genetics in the real context. Mm -hmm. And then we need to know uh, like how diseases are inherited. So if there is a disease, mm -hmm. if it is an inherited disease, obviously it runs in families mm -hmm. and there are uh, based on different modes of inheritance, be it dominant, recessive, X-linked or mitochondrial. But at the same time, there are diseases which may not have an immediate family history and because these are not only these are complex, that means they are not caused by single gene, but there are multiple genes with varying magnitudes of effects. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they are late onset diseases. So it's very difficult to get a family history, a properly documented family history from where one would kind of trace the inheritance. So. Uh, the understanding of genetics is necessary first to delineate what we are looking into, whether it is a disease condition, are we looking into uh, developing uh, developing diagnostic tools for identifying diseases early in the population, or are we kind of trying to understand based uh, understand the mechanism of prognosis, like how a patient would react given that they have a particular condition would they all be in the uh, would they all be in the same bag or there will be different bags of approach different um, modalities of clinical management so from that context for a student it is very important that they understand the fundamental basis of inheritance that is number one and number two that uh, now with the deeper understanding of the human genome we know that we are not dealing with single genes. We are dealing with multiple genes. And uh, these genes, again, have alleles which may have large effect, which are basically mutations. Mm -hmm. But there are equally important alleles of intermediate effect and uh, low effect, which are more prevalent in the population. Mm -hmm. But And uh, they would be there in, uh, in individuals who do not manifest the disease but their combinations or their interactions with other alleles, maybe the rare alleles, et cetera, can trigger a phenotype. So that is why from the context of um, understanding the biological basis of a disease from the point of view of understanding molecular mechanisms, it is very important to understand its fundamentals. This yeah. is from the, the student's perspective, but for a general population, Mm -hmm. uh, for a lay public, for instance, mm -hmm. they need to actually appreciate the fact that uh, these genes or these mutations or these variations do not occur just by chance. There is a mechanism behind which, by which it is occurring. Mm -hmm. So at least some kind of a lay understanding needs to be there so that um, like if, if there is a disease, an inherited disease in the, pop, in the family. Mm -hmm. So it should not be seen as it's a kind of a taboo, it's a kind of a curse, or it's a kind of a other social forbidden mechanism by which it has uh, penetrated into the family, either from the parental side or from uh, from any of the relatives. 
but there is a mechanism with which it operates. Yes. And having said that, um, it is also important to kind of promulgate some of the common facts, like for instance, uh, with the deeper understanding of the genome, we know that even a normal individual carries 30 to 40 disease causing mutations at any given time, mm -hmm. maybe more. Um, like between you and me, we might be carrying certain disease causing mutations, but the reasons right. we do not manifest it is because of there are there are other mechanisms, there are modified alleles, there are other uh, mechanisms that suppress the expression of these genes. So some of these um, understandings have to be promulgated in a very late terms mm -hmm. to the general public. Yeah. That it is, it is a kind of a biological process. It is not that it has come all of a sudden it's out of the blue that your child or your family member has been affected with a particular disease. Yeah, yeah very, very true, sir. So it was very um, uh, properly put, like there should be a kind of awareness among the families who carry the uh, variants, like they should know the process of how it runs in families. So if I recall, you mentioned that uh, you're working on a disease, which is kind of highly prevalent in a population in Andhra Pradesh, like a kind of uh, population in Andhra Pradesh. So I would ask you, like, is what is the level of awareness in that population about that particular disease? Like, or is there any kind of outreach that like you take to tell them how, how it exactly happens, what should they do more about that and all of that. If you could elaborate on that, it will, it will be nice. So when we kind of uh, analyzed our initial epidemiological data, mm -hmm. uh, what was found is that uh, it, uh, it doesn't have a particular susceptibility to a defined ethnic group. So it is within the population of Amsa. So there are multiple ethnic groups. Right. And then what could be found is a general phenomena, a social phenomena, that within uh, these populations, for instance, there is a there is a urge to keep the property intact. So people marry within the families, mm -hmm. so that the property doesn't go out of the family, and that is the reason why consanguinity creeps in. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, if when we looked into our data, so not only first cousins, but there were a lot of uncle niece marriages. Right. Okay. And this actually kind of triggers autosomal recessive diseases over a period of time because the gene pool gets fixed within that particular group. And then obviously, if there is a, uh, if there is a mutant allele and uh, they try to, they kind of propagate and um, kind of, mm -hmm. um, kind of um, initiate this disease process. Yes. So that is one of the things where um, the awareness has to be only through educating people. Mm -hmm. So for instance, when patients comes to our uh, institute, now the clinicians are aware that what are the other demographic causes. So mm -hmm. like consanguinity, for instance, is a demographic feature, it's not a clinical cause. Exactly. So they try to count or kind of counsel at the same time, like um, within their, uh, further within their family that they should actually marry outside the family. Very simple, in very simpler terms, yes, that at yes. least they should avoid the blood relatives or things like that, which mm -hmm. will. Uh, the awareness, I would say, is relatively more in individuals who had or in the families which had such kind of a mm -hmm. case. Uh, but we are also uh, doing this in terms of outreach because LV Prasad I Institute also has a very big outreach program in the sense that we run through a pyramidal structure of management where we have a center of excellence or a tertiary center at the top of the pyramid and then down uh, in the villages, for instance, for every 10 village, we have something called as a vision center or a primary eye health center. Okay. These 10 such primary eye health center feeds into a secondary center where there is an ophthalmologist who mans it. And uh, this um, structure again has come out out of our epidemiological survey, where we found that cataract and refractive errors are the major causes of blindness. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we also found is that 60% um, of the population mm -hmm. is blind due to cataract, another 30% due to refractive errors, 
and it is only 10 percent of the blinded population uh, which is attributable to diseases uh, more complex diseases like retinitis or like retinal diseases glaucoma corneal diseases and so on and so forth so if we could take care of those first two that is the 60 percent and the 30 percent 90 percent of the population would already be uh, kind of uh, free of blindness so in simpler terms what we did is we initially uh, made vision centers these are again single or uh, a two room structure which does have a slit lamp where a vision technician who is again a person from the community who is taken brought to lv prasad institute trained and put back into the community so they man these centers and uh, they do a refraction because 30 percent of the blindness is just because one does not have a proper refraction there are refractive errors and people develop uh, I, uh, these problems mm -hmm. because they do not have proper spectacles mm -hmm. so just doing a refraction and providing or prescribing a spectacle takes care of 30 percent so that is the base of our therapy mm -hmm. so we have these vision centers now on top of these vision centers we have as i said 10 vision centers they merge to a secondary center which is in a district and uh, these secondary centers are capable of doing surgeries. And now cataract being one of the most common surgeries because and it is an aging problem, like post 50, people, uh, people's lens start, start graying, like you have graying of hairs, you have graying of lens. So the lens just needs to be replaced and the artificial lens needs to be put in. So there we have ophthalmologists and that takes care of 60% of the population, 60% of the blindness. Yes. So, but in these structures, since these are already well spread out structures, these are permanent structures in the villages and in the districts and so forth. So the awareness of other diseases are also kind of promulgated through these, mm. like whether, uh, what are the precautions that are needed to be taken so that uh, a disease doesn't recur in their families and so on and so forth. So those kind of an outreach is there. And then in addition, we have other public outreach programs like school screenings across the state and yeah, because we try to catch them young and then prescribe whatever okay. uh, whatever treatment needs mm -hmm. to be there. So those are the things we do. The, that, yeah, there was one interesting point where you said a person from the own community, if he goes and says it will be kind of a, a greater reach for the people and they'll be able to connect more. Yeah. That's indeed very, very interesting, sir. So this brings me to the and last- not only that, just to, yeah, yeah. just to add to that, um, it's not only that person is put back, mm -hmm. even the centers are owned by the people in that community. So there is a kind of an ownership, right? Okay. There's an ownership, there's an accountability, there's a responsibility. So- That's, that's really that. great. That's really great, sir. It's a very nice, interesting piece of information from this session. So uh, you being in a very translational field in a medical setting, what do you think uh, can be one future step? What, what do you exactly vision as the future progress in our nation? Like combining the Mendelian genetics knowledge and uh, shaping our public health policies. What would you, what is your comment on that? Yeah, so uh, taking this forward, I think we need to, uh, do this in multiple steps. Number one, okay. like suddenly we have seen an avalanche of genetic testing centers across mm -hmm. the country. And uh, left, right, and center uh, patients are referred and results are generated, exome data are generated and sent there, sent back, and so on and so forth. I think first of all is the education and awareness that mm -hmm. needs to come right from the initial stages. Like for instance, in medical curriculum, uh, again, the genetic education is not given that much of a uh, priority or even if it is there, I mean, it is, I doubt if it is taught with equal rigor because being in a clinical institute, I can see mm -hmm. that not all medical graduates have a firm understanding of medical genetics, for instance. Because it's not only eye, it's across the, it's the entire body from head to toe, whether you are doing with neurology, ophthalmology, pulmonology, cardiology, anything. Mm -hmm. 
So that training initially needs to be a bit rigorous, number one. Mm. And if clinicians are trained adequately mm. in genetics, that will kind of uh, put many of these things in check. For instance, it would not allow random mushrooming of these centers across the country. Mm. So, and uh, because if they have an understanding, because now what happens is what I find that most of the time clinicians are soft targets and they are kind of allude to uh, kind of give samples and uh, they send out their patients and uh, right. then they do not uh, really make a sense of what the data is or how that has to be interpreted. Mm -hmm. So that uh, rigor needs to be there in the medical education. That is number one. Number two, we need uh, we need to have this not as a not as a individual institute initiated programs like there are uh, if you see across the country there are only few institutes like yours for instance mm -hmm. which takes uh, genetic um, genetics were research as well as genetic education very seriously mm -hmm. but across the country there are very few and far between right? right so it should be more in terms of uh, i mean uh, i could be a kind of an extrapolation if i could say so right. that like we have this indian administrative service indian police services mm -hmm. why not have something like indian genetic service right so yes. where then not only the level of education, the training, the competency, everything mm -hmm. kind of matches out and then finds out two different levels. Exactly. Both at the level of um, level of uh, understanding the disease, both at the level of uh, kind of uh, testing, both at the level of management of the mm -hmm. disease. And even added to that, the genetic counseling, which plays a pivotal role in all of this, I think we need to have a very systematic way of counseling this patient. So in addition to clinicians, the paramedical staff, which does the genetic counseling, both clinicians also need to be trained. But the paramedics who are more specialized in genetic counseling, they also need to kind of go through this kind of an exercise. Right. And having that kind of a scenario will kind of promulgate the mm -hmm. genetic education to mm -hmm. a broader spectrum of the population because mm -hmm. if it is part of a service there will be a structure there will be uh, there will be adequate quality control measures and there would be accountability so that is uh, one thing second thing is uh, particularly when uh, like uh, we have in the united states like genetic testing cannot be done on ev any and every case randomly right there are like FDA has out outlined certain guidelines based on which a genetic test can be performed. We cannot randomly do genetic testing. There are uh, prerequisites for that. We yes. cannot do parallel testing uh, just for the sake of uh, doing it. So yes. there are guidelines. And then there are certified labs, the clear certified labs, for instance. So we need that kind of a mechanism because obviously even with institutes or few big institutes, which does this work very professionally, like IJIB. We need many such uh, many such centers. So if these are kind of at the level of clear certifications, where they know what they are doing, they know how to kind of um, generate the data, analyze and interpret the data, and make clinical sense out of the data. So mm -hmm. those are the things that that is another thing that needs to come in. And thirdly, uh, like whenever we generate these data, the phenotype is very important because at the end of the day, genotypes need phenotypes. Mm -hmm. So unless the phenotyping is accurate, unless the phenotyping is deep, and by deep phenotyping, I mean that you just not uh, focus only on one aspect of what we are looking into, but considering the person as a whole, it may be a patient, it may be a normal individual. So that kind of a rigor needs to be there. Like UK Biobank is one such example where such rigor is there. And so we need in India such kind of a, such kind of a deep phenotyping mm -hmm. mechanism. And it has to be harmonized across mm -hmm. all centers and all studies so that these are comparable. Yeah. We need to have some kind of a Database. I mean, IJIB already has 
has been the forerunner in many of these, like mm -hmm. the, the Indian genome variation database and things like right. that. But at the same time, the clinical database also needs to be equally strong so that right. um, from there, a lot of uh, additional insights can be drawn. Uh, like, like, for instance, we can now use UK Biobank data mm -hmm. to generate certain insights right, on particular diseases or traits or on quantitative traits and so on and so forth. So uh, those uh, things needs to be in the... Uh, exactly. In the, in yes, the so I, I would thank you uh, very much for this interesting session. It was indeed uh, many interesting points you had uh, brought in this session and uh, I hope it will it will be like really enlightening for anyone who listens to this session. So I uh, take this time to convey my thanks for sharing your time and your thoughts to all of us, sir. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Marcy. Thanks for putting this session together yes. and um, also for your questions. And I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank and you. hopefully this collection of interviews, I think that will also act as a good repository and yes. will we kind of in the advancement of genetic educational training. Thank you very much. Thanks, and thanks to IKP again for putting this effort together. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a nice day. Thank you.